this week on the Back Table Podcast. I was the only fellowship trained IR there. There was another guy that helped to recruit me there, but he was sort of doing the procedures. Recall there weren't IR fellows. There were many of the people that were practicing even into the mid-90s were not fellowship trained. They were sort of on the job trained and some of them were really good. I learned a lot from people that hadn't actually done fellowships. But there was a guy that was there and he recruited me to grow the business and he would always come by and go, what are you doing that for? That's so dangerous. You're going to hurt the pay. It was almost like he was naysaying it and a little bit of jealousy, maybe that, you know, we were introducing new things that he hadn't thought about. But I, I learned from that, that even within our own group, that for the first six months, I better not mess up because they will use that against me or against the group going forward. Welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. For more than a decade, Reflow Medical has designed and engineered medical devices that respond to unmet clinical needs. The Wingman Crossing Catheter with its unique extendable beveled tip and an expanded indication for CTOs. The Specs LP, created to meet the need for a low-profile version of the Specs shapeable support catheter, and the new line of core catheters that answers the call for a suite of effective tools to use in challenging PCI procedures. Discover the Medtronic solutions for peripheral embolization. Concerto detachable coils are available in complex shape for framing and helical shape for filling. The MVP microvascular plug comes in sizes from 3 to 9, with 3 and 5 being microcatheter compatible. Learn more at www.medtronic.com forward slash embolization. And now back to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Ali Behetti, coming to you from Tacoma, Washington. And I have the pleasure of introducing a really special, important guest today, Dr. Alan Matsumoto chair of the Department of Radiology at the University of Virginia and fellow of the Society of Interventional Radiology. He is also the vice chair of the American College of Radiology's Board of Chancellors, among many other accolades. Dr. Matsumoto, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ali. It's great to see you and great to be here. Awesome. This is part of one of our History of IR series that we're doing, and I really would love to talk a little bit about what brought you into IR and kind of what you've seen in your long and illustrious career. So let's just get into it. Tell me a little bit about your path to interventional radiology. Well, thanks for that question. We all have our own stories and how we've gotten into our specialties or our careers. I thought I wanted to become an internist and I was destined to become a cardiologist. So I went into internal medicine and my brother-in-law was an interventional cardiologist and he drove me crazy because all he wanted to do is talk about medicine and I did not want medicine to consume my life. So I started looking around and during one of the liver rounds when we had back in those days, every Friday you go meet with the drug guys and they would give you pizza and free beer. The chair of medicine was there and he's a cardiologist and I talked to him. I said, you know, I see this guy down in radiology and he does these procedures like GI bleeds and, you know, I'm thinking about going to radiology and he pulls me aside and we're drinking a beer and he goes, you know, if I had all do over again, I'd probably do what he's doing too because I'm just stuck with the heart. He does everything else. And at that time I said, well, what is it he actually does? He goes, well, I think it's called special procedures or NGO or something, interventional radiology or something like that. And I said, okay. So that's how I sort of discovered it. I, I didn't know what it was. I knew very little bit about radiology. Radiology was an elective as a fourth year medical student that you took when you wanted to come in late and leave early. <laughs> so I had no idea what it was. Isn't that fascinating? So it wasn't even an IR doctor that first got you interested in it. It was a cardiologist. So, so yeah. what did you do once you learned about the specialty? Well, I talked to him a little bit more. I decided that I wanted to get the clinical training. I liked patients. So I finished my medicine residency and then decided to go into radiology, presuming I was going to go do this thing, whatever you called it, which was called special procedures. So I ended up doing my residency in radiology at University of North Carolina. And it was interesting back in those days when you look back at interventional radiology, we didn't even have DSA. Wow. Sometimes we took pictures on cut films. I remember our primary angio suite at UNC didn't even have a C-arm. It was 
just one plane. And if you needed to get an oblique view of the pelvis or the lungs, you rotated the person up on their side and you did cut films. And Allie, I know you're too young to remember what cut films were, but film used to come out at one time in a big roll and you used to have to cut each piece off. And then the major innovation came that each individual film would go through, be collected in a chamber, then you process them all in a dark room and they'd come out. And that's where the term wet reading came from because they come out of the developer wet and you hold them up to a light and you give the ED doc or referring doc or you look at it, that was a wet reading. That's fantastic. Actually, I have heard you tell me about wet reading before. So that has stuck in my brain for what a wet read means. Just to give me some understanding, how long did it take from when you would you know, take a picture on your x-ray to when you actually saw what the x-ray showed? Back in those days, an angio, if you took a picture and you run it in the dark room, two, three minutes. Okay. And then you'd have a roloscope in the procedure room and the tech would hang it there and you'd look at it. You walk over, you look at 20 films and you say, there's the GI bleed or there's the PE. In those days, we did have many pre-shaped catheters too. So it was not uncommon for us to have a little, what we called a candle or a Bunsen burner equivalent where we could steam catheters and shape them because we didn't really have steerable guide wires when I was a resident. We had a Benson wire and a J wire and a pigtail catheter and some end hole catheters. And we didn't have sheaths back then. You, you went directly in the artery with a, a 6.5 French catheter. So that gives me some perspective because, you know, sometimes I get frustrated if like it takes too long for the CT scan to recon and I'm doing a procedure, a CT guided procedure. You had to wait two to three minutes for your angio to come back to see if there is a PE or a GI bleed. Wow. Well, in fact, some of the attendings I worked with smoked cigarettes. Uh huh. And so why the films were being running, they'd walk outside, break scrub and smoke uh. a cigarette and then come back in and look at the films. That's fantastic. That is really, really great. What was the culture like at UNC during your training? It was relatively loose. You didn't have this requirement to be present during key portions of the procedures. And so it was not uncommon that a third or fourth year resident did a procedure with a first or second year resident with the attending just coming to look at the films after the procedure's done. So you had a lot more hands-on experience and you relied a lot on your senior residents to pass you information. And you just hoped that you didn't get misinformation or learn bad habits. Ah, yes, yes. The transference of the black pearls from the older residents to the younger, that was probably a thing. Do you remember any significant black pearls that you learned, which later in your career you were like, wait, that's not true? Fortunately, I don't have any a recollection of significant black pearls because uh, I would always try to validate it or just claim innocence if someone said something about it and I, I'd delete it from my memory, but it was interesting. We would do things, though, that you just assume was okay. Uh, we didn't have embolics, so we took some styrofoam or furniture packing and grind it in a blender, make different sizes, put through little millipore filters, then put it in a little container and send it off to autoclave and use that as an embolic agent. We would cut silk suture and to inject it, or all we had was these wool-coated stainless steel coils. There was no such thing as platinum coils or tornado coils or these multiform coils. It was, you could hope you could get your catheter there, which was usually, if you were lucky, a five French catheter, but sometimes a 6.5 French catheter that you had to get there with, out into the liver to try to embolize something. And you did the patrescin drips, you know, for GI bleeds and esophageal bleeds and things like that and put the catheters in place and so or papaverin for mesenteric ischemia so and back in those days you used ionic contrast for arteriograms and if you did a runoff you would just shut the angio room door and tell the patient they could yell as loud as they want but it was going to hurt and you you would literally hear them scream at the top of the lungs because that ionic contrast going down their leg would just hurt like heck Oh my goodness. Wow. I'm thankful we don't have to deal with that anymore. Although we still get screaming patients, you know. <laughs> <laughs> very, very different for different reasons. So that was obviously back when that was the traditional four years of radiology, right? And then you did your one year of IR fellowship. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about what your fellowship was like back then? I went off to Georgetown and did a fellowship with my mentor, Clemens Barth. And I was supposed to join he and one other person. It was a small division. 
And while I walked in on day one, July 1st, Dr. Barth told me that, oh, the other faculty member left. So it's just me and you. And he goes, by the way, I'm going to Germany on July the 10th and I'll be away for 17 days. So you'll be on your own for 17 days starting July the 10th. I became the IR guy within two weeks of my fellowship. And the, the poor resident that was with me, who happens to be an IR now on faculty at Duke by the name of Paul Suhaki, he was my resident. He was a second year resident. And he was getting me oriented to the Georgetown and where things were. And he and I were it for 17 days. I was the attending. He was essentially the fellow. And a couple of the memorable things that I did that first 17 days, I remember doing a bilateral percutaneous nephrostomy on an 800-gram baby at the bedside in the bassinet for fungus balls for obstructed kidneys. So I had to make my own little pigtail catheters and put them in using ultrasound and a pleurable CR. Paul and I did a transhepatic biliary tube, but also a transhepatic feeding tube in a patient that had esophageal cancer and gastric obstruction, and they were getting dehydrated. So not only did we put a biliary drainage tube in because they had biliary obstruction, but adjacent to that, we put a little pigtail catheter in through which they could at least give him some TPN enterally and thought, boy, that was interesting. Talk, talk about flying by the seat of your pants as soon as you, you become an attending. Wow. The third case I remember was a pelvic trauma that came in in mass trousers, and she was the daughter of a radiologist in the community of Washington, D.C. Oh. She came in hypotensive, and we did a pelvic embolization, and we were able to remove the mass trousers from her while she was on the table for a pelvic bleed. And so I learned a lot in those first 17 days, so much so when Dr. Barth came back from Germany, I felt like I was being held back by the attending. So ah. it was, yeah. <laughs> You were like, you can go away now. I got this. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Isn't that amazing? I mean, how how many years ago was that that you did all those cases? It was 1987. Okay. July of 1987. Okay. So can I tell you something embarrassing? I was not born yet then. So <laughs> you did those cases before I was born and you, and you still remember them to this day. Yeah. You remember some things. I, I've never forgot complications as well. Sure. Some that go back to before when you were born as well. Yeah, I can guess that the type of complications you guys had back then were a little bit different than the ones we had now. I'm sure your threshold to do a procedure was a little bit different as well. Do you care to, to share any sh any stories about that? Well, what was interesting is back then, balloons were, we were lucky if they were on five front shafts, but they sometimes were on seven front shafts. So it was routinely used eight, nine French sheaths. We had no closure devices. So everything was handheld. And I remember we were doing an SFA angioplasty and a great puncture on a gentleman that was having claudication. And he wanted to be able to dance with his daughter at her wedding without having claudication. So we did his procedure from an antigrade approach because we didn't have good up and over catheters and sheaths. And post-procedure, we lost control of the groin he bled. He became hypotensive. He eventually went to this OR. Eventually, he went into ATN, and he actually didn't survive. And so not only did we not help him dance the dance with his daughter at the wedding, he was not able to even be present at his daughter's wedding. That's very unfortunate. Um, thank you for sharing that story. And it, that means a lot that it stuck with you this long, a case like that. Do you remember kind of what some of the crazy requests you got back when you were um, a resident and a fellow of procedures to do? I can't rem remember because usually when they got really crazy, I would refer them to the attending and say, you handle this. But we were doing a lot of lymphangiograms with cut downs back in those old, old days and the old bipedal lymphangiography. That was a new skill. And then I got exposed to the Taruma wire that year when I was a fellow. There was the Taruma rep was a single Japanese guy to this day, Winston Unamura, that I remember him. He was the sole rep, and that was his sole product. And all I did was drive around the United States selling that one product. Oh. <laughs> and, 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 and it, it, was, it, it was like essentially an 035 Glidewire? Yes, that's what it was. It was the 035 <laughs> Glidewire. It became our magic wire because you could go through occlusions. You could get it to steer up a paddock artery through these catheters. That, and I got introduced to the Target Therapeutics Tracker Microcatheter and a Microwire. 
before that knew nothing about microcathodes. In fact, one of my first papers that I wrote as a fellow was just proving that you can inject gel foam through the microcatheter. Amazing. So was, <laughs> we didn't have stents, we didn't have microcatheters, steerable wires, everything that sheaths, up and over sheaths, balloons on micro, you know, just sort of all these little things, all these different embolics. We didn't have them then. So it, it required us to be a little bit more ingenious. We, we sometimes created our own catheters. We had hole punches to make additional holes. We learned how to rehub catheters. So, so what does rehubbing catheters mean? What does that mean? So in the old days, if the catheter was too long uh-huh. and we needed to make it shorter for a pediatric patient, we would have to cut off the back end, disconnect the metal hub that was there, flare out the end of the catheter and make it so that there was a nice non-leaking hub on the back of a catheter, but not 65 or 80 cm's in length, but maybe 30 cm in length because we were doing an angiogram on a little kid. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So you, because they didn't have catheter shorter. Yeah. Things like that. So you had to make your own. Oh man. I, you know, I feel like some of these skills will be really useful in my practice or for a lot of younger folks to learn. I, I think maybe you should do a series on how to do like finagle with your equipment. So it works when you want it, when you don't have everything you want, right? Just really, really different, different time. So how did you get involved in aortic work? Well, when I went to University of Virginia and joined Dr. Tegmeyer, I went there to work with he and Bain Selby, and it was a lot of fun. He taught me you have to sell yourself as an interventional radiologist to a patient. So I remember watching him doing a procedure, and when he'd get done with the procedure on every one of his patients, he'd take his hat off, he'd take his mask off, look him straight in the eye and say, I'm Dr. Tegmar. I'm your doctor, I'm the doctor who did your procedure. If you ever need me, call me, I'm Dr. Tegmar. And he, he made that point. In fact, when he passed away on February 9th, 1996, Fritz and I, Fritz Engel, my colleague here, we got calls from many of his patients saying, what am I going to do? I've lost my doctor, Dr. Tegmar. And so Fritz and I said, well, call us. And so I got involved with aortic work mainly when it started becoming a thing in in like 1998, 99. And we thought that it would be great to maybe create a core lab and be a core lab facility. That's how we initially got involved with it. And then some of the device companies came by and we worked with our cardiothoracic and vascular surgeons at that time and said, let's get involved. But we set up the core lab that really led to... Medtronic getting FDA approval for their Anurex endograph in 1999. And in fact, I had the pleasure of testifying with the FDA during the hearing that led to the Anurex endograph getting FDA approved for the AAA. So we got involved and we did in a partnership with our cardiovascular surgeons. And it was a lot of fun and it just evolved from there and it became sort of a partnership that if necessary, before closure devices and such, they do a cut down and create conduits for us and we would have the catheter skills, they'd have the surgical skills, we had the imaging skills and it it just grew from there. Do you remember what those first few cases were like? Were they pretty harrowing? They were Interesting, you know, all this stuff, but you had to teach the surgeons about parallax and profiling the arteries and that the, even though on a two-dimensional image, the artery looked like you had the ostium profiled, but you had to angle it appropriately. We had to take that in consideration. We had to realize putting something in that's 23 to 25 French, that's relatively stiff, would not go up a tortuous vessel. And you start seeing vessels according on you and you say, oh my gosh. What's going on there? Or, you know, pulling the sheath out and the artery comes out with it or something like that. Fortunately, that never happened with us, but there was, you know, the vessel on a stick. That's what it was called when you pulled the sheath out and it was the artery stuck to it. And basically you ripped the artery off and the patient was obviously hypotensive at that point. And you had to have emergency surgery or a, a balloon occlusion up the other side while you get it repaired. You learned a lot of little details about uh, that anatomy. It also taught me about the complex anatomy, the common femoral artery, and just the simplicity of what we took for granted of puncturing a femoral artery and holding it, that how if you puncture through a piece of calcium, 
you can hold as long as you want, but it's almost like you took a core out of it and it's just going to keep squirting for a long time. That's true. Yeah. And this is all before ultrasound was used for access, right? Yep. And we started using access in our hands in the late 90s. But prior to that, it was sort of like what Dr. Tegmar would tell us is ultrasound's only good for fishing and finding fish and nothing else. And so that generation, it was just you triangulated, you used fluoroscopy, and you stuck things. I need to hear more about Dr. Tegmeyer. I mean, he just sounds like such an interesting individual to work with. What was it like learning from him? You learn to listen. That's how you learn from him. One of the things I learned from him is if you're going to ask his opinion, you better let his opinion influence what you do. Because if you've already made up your mind, he taught me don't bother to waste his time asking his thoughts about something. He, he was technically very gifted. He had great clinical judgment. I also learned he cared deeply about renal angioplasty. He and Tom Sauce were what I considered to be fathers of renal angioplasty. And I, I remember he went away to go to a meeting. In fact, he went down to Barry Katz's meeting in, in Miami, and Fritz and I were there, and we got called about a renal artery occlusion with someone, renal function deteriorating. We found out that they had a renal artery occlusion and a good-sized kidney so I went in and recanalized it and salvaged the kidney, and he heard about it, and he said, don't you ever dare do another renal without me present. You should have called me. I would have flown back to do a renal. Renal's my territory. You can develop something else. And that's when I developed interventions for you know chronic mesenteric ischemia, but it, it became evident that he took great pride in the renals, and he wanted to have his hands on every one of them. And so he didn't mind if we assisted him. So I assist him a lot to learn from him and just his thought processes. Yeah. Wow. That's, um, that is quite territorial indeed. Yeah. So how did you come up with the chronic mesenteric ischemia work? Was that, did that just fall in your lap? It just sort of came about because we were fortunate enough at, at University of Virginia to get a lot of referrals for PAD and atherosclerotic disease and FMD. And an issue about chronic mesenteric ischemia came about. But this is before we had stents available. So the big fear is, gosh, if you bugger up that SMA, you're going to cause acute mesenteric ischemia. And you better have a surgeon that's willing to jump right in behind you to operate. So we took that pathway very gingerly, made sure our surgeons were comfortable with it. We used to leave an OR available in case we had a complication. And that's why we needed good colleagues that said, yes, we'll, we'll arrange for that. And then after we did about a dozen of them and all went fine, we, we took away from having an OR available for mesenteric ischemia. And then it was just a matter of choosing the right patients and following up and demonstrating that it, it had a benefit in a certain percentage of patients. And some patients, they need to have surgery. And then once stents became available, gee whiz, it just became a a lot easier to do. And then steerable, you know, guide catheters, steerable sheaths, all that just made it much more easier than the radial approaches made it even easier. Sure. Could you tell me a little bit more about your first years at UVA? How was the culture there a little different from where you'd trained before? It was uh, very different because Dr. Tegmeyer ran the IR suite like an OR. He had trained three years as a surgeon his father was a famous surgeon in World War II. In fact, he's even mentioned in Stephen Ambrose's book uh, about the Battle of Normandy. There was Dr. Tegmar, the surgeon there. That was Dr. Tegmar's father. Everything was very organized. We had to do everything the same way, and it was the way the trays were set up exactly the same, the how you prep and access were exactly the same. So basically, whatever I learned at Georgetown or North Carolina, I had to adapt to the University of Virginia way. And there was some benefit to that because whether Dr. Tegmar did the case, Dr. Engel did the case, Dr. Selby did the case, or I did the case, we could walk in the room and we knew what the table was set up and what the catheters were on the tray. The techs knew they could just set up and it flow rather than, that's not what I use, get me something else or something like that. Standard filming rates, standard injection rates, everything was standardized. And so when Dr. Tegmeyer passed away and we hired additional folks that came from different places, one came from the Brigham, one came from Penn, then we started saying, well, there are other ways of doing things. And it created a little bit more variability and a little bit more variety and in many ways, probably a more diverse training experience for the fellows. 
but it drives our techs and nurses a little bit different because everybody has had a little bit of different, This no, this is my standard protocol. These are sure. the catheters. These are the drugs I like to use. It's a balance, right? Because you, you want to you wanna adapt to what people are comfortable with, but you also don't want to create so much variability between the staff that they don't know how to set up a tray. I really valued that, that it was always the same every single time if you're working with a certain attending. Now, sometimes I feel like I go in the angio suite and they have nothing set up and they're like, well, I don't know what you want. And I'm like, I've literally done this case with you 30 times. How do you not know what I want yet? Yeah, I think I think there's just there's something to be said for uniformity in how we uh, set up trays and plan our procedures. Um, OK, well, I've gotten a little off topic, um, but is there anything that you want to tell us more about your training at Georgetown or how that progressed after your attending came back? Any memorable cases or any any surprises for you? No, I think my most memorable cases were in those first three weeks. Everything after that was just learning. I, I Because I had trained at North Carolina and learned a lot of musculoskeletal interventions, even though that was not part of IR and they had a musculoskeletal division, I was able to help teach the musculoskeletal attending there how to do bone biopsies with the Harlow Wood device. Body imaging was doing some of the drainage procedures, and because I would had a lot of experience doing abscess drainages and things like that, that I got to go over there and help them learn some of the things I'd learned during residency. So I, I think the, the, the thing I enjoyed the most was actually the independence of being able to do things, which I think it's a little detrimental now that we have to hover so much. There is a bit of hovering nowadays, absolutely. One of the attendings there, it might have been Dr. Sheeran or Dr. Wilkins, always told me that the best place to have a complication is during your training, because then you see how your attendings respond to it, and then you know how to deal with it when you're out in practice. Yeah, there's no question about that, because, you know, I was anxious to get out on my own till I got out on my own, and I looked to my left and I looked to my right, and I was wondering what to do, and I realized those security blankets aren't there anymore. So that's when I realized I had the rest of my career to practice independently, do what the heck I wanted. And I'm thankful for the supervision and the input I had. And that's part of one of the reasons, you know, I went out to private practice and I came back to academics because I, I missed having those colleagues that could provide me feedback and to be in that continuously learning environment, an environment that you had other opinions and other perspectives. So were you in private practice right after Georgetown before you came to UVA? I finished my fellowship at Georgetown and stayed on at Georgetown one extra year as a junior attending to practice because my wife was doing a two-year neuro fellowship. Back in those days, neuro was two years of fellowship. So I stayed on Georgetown as a junior attending. So I had another year of experience, which was a lot of fun. And then I went into private practice on the west coast of Florida thinking I wanted to create a vascular center of excellence. And I went, I went to a 320-bed hospital. They said they wanted to develop IR more. They were doing 12 to 15 procedures a week. And that procedure could be anything from a venogram to a biopsy to an abscess drainage. And, and mind you, this is before pick lines and tunnel lines were in ports. This was in the late 80s. And so I went there thinking we'd do 12 to 15 cases a day. And my job was to build up the practice and within six months, I was doing 12 to 15 cases a day. And, and so part of that was because I started admitting patients. I started doing rounds and consulting, and the uh, general practitioners and the general surgeons loved it. I made myself available. The good part is it grew very quickly. I put myself on call every night of the week when I was in town, whether or not I was on call, because I felt like your level of service is only as good as the weakest component of your service. And if call is weak, I'm not going to get the referrals. So I also realized in private practice, they're not going to call you in the middle of the night unless they want to be called in the middle of the night with a result. So more often than not, they would call me first thing in the morning and say, hey, this case came in last night. Can you do it today? I made sure to do it. But then I'd go around and they would see me. They'd ask about this patient in the hospital. I'd say, put a consult in, I'll see it, and I'll take care of it. You touched on some really important points there. A couple follow-up questions. Was it hard for you to get hospital privileges at that time to admit patients, or it was a, it was granted? It was not a problem, and it advantaged me because I had my boards in internal medicine. Yeah, okay, got it. In fact, that came to play when I admitted a thrombolysis patient to the ICU, and the pulmonologist 
said, what's a radiologist putting a, a patient in the ICU for? All the ICU patients are supposed to come off over to we pulmonologists. We don't allow anybody else to admit to the ICU unless it's us. And I said, okay, great. What do you know about thrombolytics and how to manage the problem? And I said, so if you can't do that, I'm supposed to turn my patient over to you when that's the primary reason they're in the ICU. And they then granted me privileges and backed off, stopping me from admitting my own patients to the ICU. Because in those days, we put all our thrombolytic patients in the ICU for 24 to 48 hours. Right. Yeah, that's such a good point. And the one thing that that gets me in that anecdote is that you really took ownership of all your patients. It wasn't just somebody referred them to you, you took care of them and you sent them back. It was they were your patient for life, kind of like Dr. Tegmeyer would look them in the eye with the mask off, hat off under under the drape and say, I'm Dr. Tegmeyer. I am your doctor. Call me forever. And I know from experience being at UVA, you have patients that you've been seeing for 20 to 30 years who still come and see you. Yeah. I think I was in that private practice for two years. I guess a couple of the most gratifying moments of leaving the group didn't come from radiology, but it really came from the largest internal medicine group. When they heard I was leaving, they said, we don't want you to leave. In fact, we'll pay for a lawyer to fight the non-compete clause because we want you to take care of our patients. That was one. I said, no, I, I don't want to deal with that. And, and then a surgeon that was a head of a vascular surgery group who the first month I was there and I was consenting his patient for runoff and possible angioplasty, and he heard about that. He came and summarily told me I am not to mention the word angioplasty to any of his patients. He would be determining whether a patient got angioplasty or surgery. He came up to me when he heard I was leaving, and he actually said, you know, Don, to like the work that you've done, if you've noticed, I've been sending you angioplasties. I, I, I'm going to miss you. Oh, so, okay. So, so you, what that surgeon, when he said that to you in the first month, you just kept doing angioplasties, you were like, okay, thanks. No, I honored his wish, but I would call him with the results and tell him, I didn't mention to your patient, but this is somebody I believe I can do an angioplasty on. And I left it up to him to be in control. I love that. Yeah, the, it's, a, it's a balance, right, with your referrers. So were you the only IR doctor there, or was there another guy in your practice? I was the only fellowship-trained IR there. There was another guy that helped to recruit me there, but he was sort of doing the procedures. Recall, there weren't IR fellows. There were many of the people that were practicing, even into the mid-90s, were not fellowship-trained. They were sort of on-the-job trained, and some of them were really good. I learned a lot from people that hadn't actually done fellowships. But there was a guy that was there, and he recruited me to grow the business, and he would always come by and go, what are you doing that for? That's so dangerous. You're going to hurt the patient. It was almost like he was naysaying it, and a little bit of jealousy, maybe, that you know we were introducing new things that he hadn't thought about. But I, I learned from that that even within our own group, that for the first six months, I better not mess up because they will use that against me or against the group going forward. So true. So then what made you want to go back into academics? Well, it was, it was just that, the ability to do a little bit more complex work. I miss the, the camaraderie of just talking with someone more knowledgeable or just even someone as knowledgeable to bounce ideas off and to grow. Um, I learned, too, in private practice that at least where I was at on the west coast of Florida, it was a lot about money and not about necessarily doing the right thing. In academics, I feel like we could do more of the right thing. We could banter back and forth with the surgeons and such a little bit more. Whereas in private practice, there's no way I would ever banter back with a referring physician because they will send their patients elsewhere. And that was what I learned from private practice which was, it was a great two-year private practice fellowship. But coming back to academics, I liked that intellectual conversation and the teamwork, but you had to deal more with egos in academics. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you care to share any more anecdotes about your early years at UVA as a young attending? No, I, th I think I learned a lot. I think the other anecdote was you have to balance between being a friend of the techs and nurses and being the leader in the room and of the service. There's a subtle difference there that if you become too friendly and you have to recorrect people, that they may not take it as well if they say, well, you know, Alan, you're my good friend. We just went out and had a beer last night. Why are you sort of saying I need to show up on time or all, all these kinds of things? So I think one of the things I had to learn is how do you transition from being a fellow 
to an attending and being friends with and closer in age to the residents and fellows and the staff, but understanding that you have a bigger responsibility to set an example and serve as a role model of expectations for the culture of care delivery for your, your department or your division. And it's okay to be friendly, but at some point, the higher up the food chain you go, you have to be careful about becoming too friendly because if you have to have some difficult conversations, it can become very awkward. I see. Yeah. That's an important thing that a lot of young attendings face, definitely, with text nurses, residents. What was it like going from practicing independently in private practice to going back and having to supervise residents, or I guess minimally supervise residents? That was a learning curve because it was, you know, Allie, when you treat a patient, it's very personal to you that that outcome is good. If it doesn't quite go well and you thought, uh, you know, I could have maybe done a little bit better, whatever it may have been, not cause so much pain, not have so much bleeding during an arthrostomy or whatever it might have been, you want to make sure that the patient's well taken care of, but that the trainee has the opportunity to learn. And so it's a fine balance of when you intervene and get your hands in there versus, and I felt like it took me about five to eight years to figure that transition point that I could feel comfortable enough that if a patient situation or their procedure was not going quite well, that I could salvage it without harm to the patient. And that's probably the hardest thing to do for a faculty member. And I'm more empathetic now that I'm on this side. But when I was a resident, I would wonder why the attending would put his hands in there. And I'm thinking, let me flounder a little longer, but you know. Well, that's such a good point. That You alluded to your transition to leadership in the department. Tell me how that came about. Uh, Very awkwardly, frankly. I had specifically came back to University of Virginia because Dr. Tegmar, at the time I came back here, was in his early 50s, and Bain Selby and I were same age, but he had trained at UVA, and so I felt like I could do cases, I could teach, I could maybe write some. I don't have to do any administrative work because I got Dr. Tegmeyer, I got Dr. Selby, and then Dr. Selby left to go to private practice before he went back into academics, and unfortunately, Dr. Tegmeyer passed away at a young age related to a surgical complication. He passed away at the age of 56. And so Fritz and I were the two attendings at that point. And the decision was, do we recruit for someone outside to be chief or should I be chief? And Fritz and I talked about that. And poor Fritz agreed to say, yes, Al, maybe you should be chief. And I'm with you. I got your back. And so I took that on, even though that was never my intention to become a division chief. And then as time went on, for a variety of reasons, mainly because I, I like to fix things and make sure things go well, I was asked to be vice chair of operations. And then that's when Fritz took over as division chief, and I stayed on as vice chair of operations. And then one of our chairs left, they asked me to be the interim chair, and I said, sure, but I'm not going to be the chair. I just told them that. And then after a search, a period of search, they came back to me and asked me if I'd be the chair. And at that point, all the circumstances, I, I felt like maybe this is a little paternal, maybe it's not appropriate, but I felt like maybe in the best interest of the department, I should become the chair. And, and so that's why I, I actually chose it, but I never aspired to be a chair. What year did you become the chair of UVA? I became the interim chair in 2008, and then they started this search that year. And then in 2009, they had identified a chair yet. And so they came to me and asked me, they said, would I want to be the chair? Otherwise, we're going to probably have to restart the search process. It may be another year, year and a half. And being an interim chair is not a good place to be because you're sort of in charge, but you have no authority. So you have the accountability and no authority. So I decided I would go ahead and do that. And then after I assumed the role, derived a fair amount of gratification because I felt like I was serving the department. I felt like I was working for the department and trying to help the department, and that gave me a lot of personal gratification. How did you reconcile your love of angiography with having to do more administrative work? Were you still able to do a fair amount of clinical work in your early admin years? I reduced it quite a bit. Initially, it probably dropped to 40%, and then probably over the last decade, it's probably been 20%. And one of the things, before I took the chair position, I, I talked to the IR faculty and said, in order for me to be the chair and have a seat at the table, I can't take call. I just need to be available for 
major meetings with leadership and advocate on behalf of the department. And if they didn't think that was going to work for the group as a whole, but nicely, the, the faculty, IR faculty said, no, 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 we support you being chair. And yes, we're willing to cover your call and you can step out of the call. All of what you're telling me from everything, all of your interactions with Dr. Engel, especially early on, like it sounds like you've just had so much support from your colleagues your entire career that's enabled you to be where you are. Yeah, absolutely. No one does anything by themselves well. And you're only, frankly, any person that has the fortune to be in a leadership position, you're only as good as the people you're around, that you surround yourself with and that, that work with you. So that's why it's critically important to have great teammates. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your vision for the department when you became the chair. Part of it was to reestablish some clinical focus, help the respective divisions to improve clinical operations. Everything from just getting patients scheduled for an ultrasound to communication to referring physicians. So focus heavily on operations. Also, wanted to improve our educational program. It was already good, as you, you know. You came through the program, and we were very proud of the quality of residents we had, so wanted to build on that quality and expand it a little bit and iterate different programs. So the vision was to grow the diagnostic residency program, which we've done, to grow the fellowship programs, which we've done, and to grow IR, and as you know, Having gone through that pathway, we implemented that, what we call the clinical pathway towards IR, taking people straight out of medical school, which our first person was Warren Swee in 2002. And that program is essentially what the integrated IR residency track is, is what we implemented UVA in 2002. So we wanted to build on some of those kinds of things. We wanted to innovate our research technology, and that's why we were able to grow Focus Ultrasound novel interventions like that, continue to partner with uh, industry, develop new technologies and programs. And so that's what the the vision was, is really to to tighten things up, bring it together. And then as the department chair, the finances of the department weren't very good when I became the chair. I hate to say this, without money, you don't have an opportunity to create a vision or to build things. So probably the first five to seven years was to turn around the finances of the department. And that didn't really happen till probably around 2015. So probably about six years after I took over the chair position. And that's when we could really start implementing other things like improving salaries, having better infrastructure with staff, APPs, improve the technology resources here. No, I mean, you've you built a really strong department there, and um, and, uh, and congratulations. I, just, I saw that at the radiology residency was recently ranked a top 20 in the country, so congratulations on that. How were you able to make these reforms while still maintaining that same culture of excellence that you had worked with? Well, I think it's to attract, support, and inspire people that that's basically how they're wired. You want to have this, the right people on the bus that for them, that's what's driving them. They're not necessarily driven by their own personal fame or fortune. They're driven by a mission. They want to have a purpose. They want to contribute. And providing them a little autonomy to implement things that they they want to develop. For instance, you know this because you helped to launch the Global Health Leadership Program and getting giving someone like Dr. Bueno that alternative. I think just creating those opportunities for people to pursue what they want to do and making sure it's aligned with the the missions and vision for the department. Given a lot to think about here, Dr. Matsumoto, what advice do you have to other department leaders to keep their IR departments clinical and strong in the face of competing priorities in the health system? To understand that if you have a good IR program, it makes a difference not only for the patients that you're taking care of, but for the health system, the communities uh, that you serve. Part of it is to message it and make sure people see it and be visible. And you have to let people know that you're the ones providing those services. So one of the things that we've always tried to do is make sure that we're always visible on the floors and rounding. 
making sure the ICU nurses and the, and the regular acute care bed nurses, the ED nurses, know that IR is a specialty and that we, you call us, we'll take care of things. It makes it much easier for a division chief, a department chair to advocate on behalf of the IR when the hospital's MO, COO, CEO understand the value IR brings. And it's above and beyond the technical dollars you bring to them. It's helping patients get through the hospital, hearing patients thank their IR and sending emails to the CEO saying, the service we had in IR was fantastic. Their team is fantastic. Not only the Dr. Behetti's, but her nurse, her tech. They just exude confidence and warmth in caring for us. So it's that message, but then you have to have the data to show, yes, you're helping with throughput through the hospital, getting patients to their diagnosis sooner so they can get put on their chemotherapy, reducing their pain. And oh, by the way, we do help the finances. And particularly for the diagnostic group who may say, gee whiz, IRs, RVUs aren't as high as neuroradiology, or for that matter, breast imaging or body imaging. Well, IRs, because they're seeing patients, they're ordering a lot of CTs, they're ordering a lot of MRs, they're ordering a lot of duplex and ultrasounds, and they're bringing business to the diagnostic radiologist and to the system that owns the technical fee. And they keep the patients locally, and that's critically important for the communities that they serve. Nobody wants to get in the car and drive someone out, or drive somewhere else. So as they do it as part of a bigger group, it's part of how do you put that message together? Part of it's being visible and demonstrating these types of things by accumulating the data and having the databases so that you can show that. And you built a strong case for that and built a strong team around you that all support that goal. That team that continue, communicates, right? The nurses see bump into somebody in the grocery store, the tech bumps into a friend playing soccer or whatever, and they speak highly of Dr. Behetti's program or what she does and how great she, she does things, and it spreads to the community. Kind of nearing the end of our discussion, Dr. Matsumoto, I've had a really great time talking to you. I love the anecdotes you shared and just kind of the pearls that you've given. Any advice to upcoming IR doctors, trainees, early career folks that you would like to share for them to be able to have a successful and fulfilling career? Well, I'd say, first of all, remember why you went to medicine, number one. Don't lose sight of that. Money and egos can become very distracting, but don't forget why you went to medicine. Number two is understand that it is a profession. It's not a job. So if you really just want a nine-to-five job, I, I frankly don't think medicine's the right profession for you, and particularly IR is not the right profession for you. The third thing is you'll get what you put into it back and then some. And even though it may feel like a, a schlog sometime or a thrash and, you know, why you're having to do this and why you come in to see this patient or their family, you'll get the payback with the next family, the next child, or the next mother or father who says, thank you. So there's a lot more to the business of medicine than dollars and cents. And I understand you have to pay the staff you want to make a reasonable living. I'm not aware of any physician that really invests time that ever truly starves, but I see a lot of physicians that love the practice of medicine. And I think actually, if you love what you're doing, you're less likely to become burned out or less morally injured and less distracted with all these other things that are going on. Wise words. Dr. Matsumoto, thank you so much for coming on our podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your very busy schedule. I hope to learn more from you as both of our careers progress. Thank you, Ali. It's great to see your success and your, your great podcast. It's wonderful to see how popular it is. And so thanks for hosting me. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Dong, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross. 
Josh Spencer. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. Manisha Naganathanahali. And Manbir Singh Sadli. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 